the Italian anarchist, Erico Malatesta, simultaneously it figured that many on the left know of, but you know anything about. A contemporary of the classic fathers of anarchism, Peter Kropotkin and Mikhail Bakunin, Malatesta spent much of his life in flight from the authorities, living a life of political poverty while seeking whatever means he could to participate in the struggle for workers' liberty. Today we're joined by Davide Turcado, a specialist on Malatesta, to discuss anarchism and his own involvement with AK Press's publication of the complete works of Malatesta, coinciding with the release of Volume 5 of the Complete Works. Volume 5 uh, covers the years of Malatesta's third exile in London, from 1900 to 1913, and is centered around one of his key concerns from this period, the strategy and prospects of the armed strike. It, it should be noted at the outset um, that I'm not overly familiar with Malatesta, but it's definitely I hope that this conversation uh, will be able to serve as an introduction of sorts to Malatesta's biography and ideas, while, if possible, still being of interest to seasoned veterans steeped in anarchist thought. With all that aside, Davide, thank you very much for agreeing to speak with us today. Thank you very much for your interest in this volume and Malatesta in general. Absolutely. Um, to start our conversation then, I think it would be good if you could maybe introduce yourself for our listeners. Uh, so what's your background and what is it that brought you to Malatesta in the first place? Well, I am from Italy, first of all, and I presently live in Dublin. I have an interest in history, but I'm not a historian by profession. My job is in the IT industry, and my profile is computational linguist. It's a difficult uh, profile. I'm not going into that. Uh, my in and I also lived for a long time in Canada before moving to Ireland. My interest in Malatesta started when I was in my teens, and I actually became an anarchist. And so uh, when you are an Italian anarchist, you are very likely to read something by Malatesta. And I liked Malatesta right away, reading some of his pamphlets. But the real and deeper interest in Malat my interest came much later uh, in the, I would say, in the 1990s. In the meantime, I have uh, read political uh, philosophy and political writings much more broadly, and I got interested in other authors. For example, I remember liking very much um, Karl Raimund Popper and the the Open Society. And then at some point, I reread Malatesta more systematically, and I realized that much of what I was looking for in other writers was there in Malatesta. For example, this concept of open society, without this specific, specific label, but it's there in, in Malatesta's writing. And yeah, and that's when I really uh, started to consider Malatesta as uh, a writer that n needed to be known much better than it it, it was at this point, and it presently is. Um, I think it might be interesting as well to uh, hear the specialist. Uh, if you think there's any reason in particular for which um, Malatesta isn't as well known as some of the other key figures of the history of anarchism. So I wanted to ask you, um, why do you think it might be the case that uh, Malatesta is less well known than some of the other classical figures from the history of anarchism. So, obviously, Kropotkin has his, I believe it's Kropotkin, uh, The Conquest of Bread, and when it comes to other major theorists from the radical left-wing tradition, of course, Marx is massive, from the God's Capital, it doesn't seem like Malatesta wrote any um, uh, theoretical volumes of the same extent. Do you think that could be a part of why he's less well-known? Yes, I think that's part of the problem. Of course, Malatesta is well known in Italy among anarchists, not very broadly, but definitely, as I said, if you are an anarchist in Italy, you read something by Malatesta. In terms of his production, I think Malatesta was more known as a man of action than a thinker. 
he wrote a few pamphlets that were hugely popular at the time and are still popular. They are reprinted and read still today. But as you said, um, he didn't write any any book of any uh, extent, so pamphlets and lots of articles in the press. Um, and so, and part of this is that he didn't want to write anything that was definitive because he was much involved in the struggle, in the action, and so he didn't feel like pausing and writing something that was the ultimate Malatesta thought. He really wanted to engage in the struggle and keep going as much as he could. And as a result, yeah, he's known for, for his pamphlets, but these pamphlets are more considered propaganda writings than uh, the uh, treatises of anarchist thought. So that's part of the reason, I think. And also, another part of the reason might be that one of the uh, merits of Maltesta was that it was very clear in his writing, very simple. And I have the impression that this simplicity may be exchanged uh, mistakenly for lack of depth, whereas I think the greatness of Malatesta is in making complex concepts easy to understand, and so there, there are both the simplicity of writing and uh, the theoretical depth, but the second may sometimes disappear and not being uh, caught at, at first sight. One of the reasons why I think that the complete works are, of Maltesta are important is because they collect this huge number of articles that many of which are not well known but really uh, make up the body of Maltesta's thought which is not available in any single volume because I've said there is no single volume that explains his thought in... in... I, that actually leads really well on to the next question that I wanted to ask you which concerns a bit more uh, the actual project, the Complete Works project that you've been working on with AK Press. Um, obviously, you've been working on this for quite a few years now uh, with the fifth volume having just come out. But I'd be interested in hearing more about uh, what inspired maybe you and the people at AK Press uh, to bring out all of Malatesta's works as a definitive edition. And maybe also to hear about some of the challenges that this has involved. I can imagine that creating a complete works for a thinker whose thought is as perceptible and responsive to what's constantly happening as Malatesta brings its own unique difficulties as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, first of all, let me mention that the uh, complete works of Malatesta are being published both in the Italian and the English edition. And the Italian edition came first. So the real process of deciding uh, to publish uh, the complete works came with the Italian publishers. And then um, the English edition came as a, as a, as a follow-up. So the real starting process was with the Italian publishers. The idea of working on Malatesta's complete works came Again, in the late 90s, I was mentioning before that in the 90s I, I did a more systematic reading of Malatesta and I became aware of his importance. But at that point I hadn't thought about publishing the complete works. I can't pinpoint to a specific moment when I made that de decision. Um, I was reading a, a biography, not of Malatesta, but of Luigi Fabri. Luigi Fabri is another Italian anarchist. He was a friend and comrade of Malatesta, and uh, he was also collecting and, and publishing some of his articles with the idea of uh, publishing the complete work. And in fact, Fabri and others in the 1930s published three volumes. And uh, at some point, which Fabri describes the plan of the complete works by Mr. It was a 10 volume plan. And I remember having this very simple and quiet thought. I thought, well, it's time to finish this job. 
needs to be completed. And that was it. I must say, on a personal level, I'm not a person of easy decisions. So this is quite unlike me. But at that moment, I took this decision and, and that, that was it. And that started the process. And yeah, as, as I said, Malthus has read over, I would say, probably hundreds, or at least tens of newspapers, uh, anarchist periodicals throughout the world. And so collecting them is not an easy task. There are some bibliographies, but much of it is shooting in the dark. So it's challenging, but also rewarding. And it's something I've done with a lot of pleasure and uh, I'm still doing with pleasure. Um, mm. And in the process from just an editor, I also became more interested in history in general, history uh, of anarchist thought, political thought, to the point that uh, I decided to take a PhD in history with a um, dissertation on Malatesta. And I did this when I, when I was in Canada, still as a, as a, as a, I, I was working in the IT industry, but at the same time doing my, my PhD. So the uh, latest volume that's come out with AK Press, um, on, uh, of Malatesta's complete works, again, looks at, um, his life from, and his publications from 1900 to 1913. And in the introduction to this volume, it's mentioned that uh, his publication or the kinds of publications that surround him from this period are fairly uh, unique and somewhat difficult to work with as well. Um, it's mentioned that uh, of all the volumes of the complete works of Malatesta, this is the one that relied the most on things written about it rather than things that he had written himself. Uh, is there anything uh, that was happening in the years 1900 to 1913, uh, which meant that uh, he himself was writing less or that he was the subject of more attention uh, by people writing the news or by people involved in the media? This, is, this was the longest exile of Manatesta in London, 13 years. And probably they were difficult years for him because... He was. This is. This was the time where he was most uh, estranged from the Italian movement. If we take both the previous period, the 1890s, and the later period, he would come to Italy. Um, I wouldn't say frequently, but with intervals of few years, because he was involved in the movement. And whenever there was some social movement happening in Italy, he thought that the best way to have an influence on it was to be present in Italy. They didn't like to preach from London to what anarchists in Italy should do. And so he would come to Italy and join the struggle personally. The fact itself that he lived for such a long time in London without ever coming to Italy means that this connection was a bit broken, maybe because not much was happening in Italy or not much in any case that he would consider um, worth going to Italy and starting some kind of propaganda campaign or some struggle. This was, I would say, the main reason uh, why he published less than another period, because most of what he published would be in Italian anyway, even if he lived in London. I must say that he never had a strong presence in the an English language anarchist press in London. That's somewhat surprising, but I think even in London, he was more involved with the Italian anarchists that were living there and the French anarchists and the Spanish anarchists. He was, of course, in touch with the English anarchists, but the English movement itself, English anarchist movement, was not as strong as the French, Italian, and, and Spanish. And they had one main periodical, which was called Freedom, but... In such a long time, very few articles by Malatesta appeared in that periodical. So, uh, yeah, on the English side, he didn't publish much. And on the Italian side, there was less of a contact with the Italian movement. And I think um, that's part of the reason. And also, there was a problem with getting funds for his periodicals. So he tried to start a few periodicals, Italian language anarchist periodicals in London, but he didn't manage... Uh, to get them going with some continuity 
maybe for lack of readership or lack of funding. And so they didn't last very much. And the last reason why I, I think Malatesta may have had some difficulty being heard in this period was that this was the, the heyday of revolutionary syndicalism. And Malatesta was not part of the movement. He was sympathetic with, with syndicalism in general, but wasn't. Um, he didn't buy into the ideology of revolutionary syndicalism. And so this may be part of the reason why, to some extent, during this, let's say, decade, the, the, the year from 1900 to 1910, he was uh, somewhat marginalized from the main current of the Anarchist movement. Thinking again more about the specific period that this volume covers, 1900 to 1913, um, confessedly, a lot of my familiarity with radical political history comes more so from the perspective of communist history. And there was one very significant thing that happened in those years, which was the 1905 Russian Revolution. And while communists everywhere were writing extremely excitedly about this, I know that you know, in some of his writings from around this period, Malatesta is quite pessimistic about what communists are doing or what they had been doing as well. I know, for example, in one of his articles, I believe it is, um, he talks about the historic failures of the First International or the IWNA um, and the kind of direction in which Marx had pushed it, leading to some of its issues. Did he have any thoughts on the 1905 Russian Revolution or even with what was happening in Russia at this time? Yeah, he was definitely aware of it and interested in it. And London was the capital of revolutionary exile. So whatever country was in turmoil, exiles would go to London. And so there was a lot of exchange uh, between anarchists and revolutionaries of all nationalities in London. So you couldn't stay in London and not being aware uh, directly of events happening a anywhere in, in Europe. So uh, he knew a lot about this revolution firsthand. And, but I would say, um, again, in his writings, there are references to it. There is clearly interest um, in, uh, in this revolution. And in London, there were demonstrations in support of this revolution to which Malatesta took part. But I wouldn't say there is much in terms of theoretical analysis or expectations about this revolution. In general, I can say that Malatesta was very open about all kinds of social movements. So some anarchists were more, I would say, selective, if not purist. And so if a, a revolution or a social movement didn't have a specific anarchist character, they kept aloof because they didn't expect much from that moment. Malatesta was much more open. So he thought the social action was open itself and nobody knew where it would end it. So some movement might start even with conservative characters. But what he said is that social action has its own logic and it may radicalize and change objectives along the way. And so whenever masses of workers or popular masses in general were involved in direct action of any kind, he was very much interested and he had some expectation about uh, that uh, direct action to turn into some direction which were, were, was closer to his own ideas and also uh, he thought that anarchists should get involved with such movements because uh, because nobody knew where they were going. And if you just wait and to see what happens, then it's too late to join the movement at a later stage. You have to be part of it and show people that uh, you are on their side and you fight the str their struggle and you risk your own life or you risk to go to prison the same way as they do. So you have to be uh, among the people if you want to have any influence. So, uh, of course, with Russia, he couldn't go to Russia, but um, 
I'm sure, yeah, the Nils turned a very profound interest in this movement. And then you also talked about, yeah, his argument with socialists. I, I wouldn't say that the word communist was a, very popular at the time. It became popular um, as, a, as a political movement with the October Revolution 1917. But at this time, I mean, the, the, the label communist was used, but it was the, the, the strife was more between anarchists and socialists. And you aptly mentioned this article about the First International, because I think in that article, Maltesta provides a very interesting analysis and somewhat unconventional, because it's true that anarchists blamed uh, Marx and the Marxists for, for their authoritarian tendency and for wanting to uh, make the international an organ of their own tendency. But in that article, it somehow equally splits the responsibility for the, uh, for the death of the international between Marxists and anarchists. He said, to some extent, we both made the same mistake, and that mistake was to try to turn an organization which was an economical organization for the improvement of all workers and because of this should have been open to all workers without any distinction, well, we tried both to turn that organization into a political organization that we would direct and on which we would impose our own ideology. And he said, we made the same mistake as anarchists and that that's the real reason for, for its fall. And the lesson for Malatesta from the First International and what he advocated uh, since was that there should be a distinction between economic workers, economical organization for economical improvement, unions, and political parties. Use the word party to mean every political movement, not necessarily definitely not a parliamentary party, but also not necessarily a party structured as we know parties are today. So, But he talked about political parties. And he said there must be a distinction. Economical organizations, unions, should be open to all workers without any distinction, whereas political organizations should be very well defined in, term, in terms of what they want. And so as anarchists, we, would, we should have our own anarchist organization and make very clear what we want and make ourselves very uh, different and distinct from other political organizations. We shouldn't mix and try to uh, build alliances by somewhat uh, watering down our, our own ideas. We should be clear about what we want as anarchists and as anarchists we should join into the economic organization in unions. So, uh, I don't know if maybe this might be part of what you wanted to ask, but this distinction between economic organization and political organizations has very much to do with, uh, with the themes Malatesta discussed in this particular uh, volume and with the title The Armed Strike. So the arm strike, the concept of arm strike was obviously um, opposed or counterposed to the concept of general strike. And the general strike was the central concept of revolutionary syndicalism. The idea was that through the, the general strike, workers could make a revolution because they were the producers. And so by refusing to work, they would um, force um, the bourgeoisie to uh, to concede defeat, and they would eventually take over the means of production. So, um, the idea of revolutionary syndicalists, and among them there were many anarchists, was that uh, syndicates uh, are self-sufficient. Anarchists should be involved in unions and work entirely in unions because through unions and through uh, the general strike they would achieve revolutionary means. 
Malatesta, as I said, didn't believe that. So the concept of armed strike, well, at the tactical level means that Malatesta didn't believe that general, the general strike could be su successful in, in, in a revolutionary, uh, with a revolutionary objective. He thought, well, he said in, in, in his articles that um, it was naive to think that the workers could starve the bourgeoisie by a general strike. And he said, the bourgeoisie have more resources than the workers. And so the workers were, would starve first before they would manage to starve the bourgeoisie. And so it was... It wasn't a likely scenario to think of a general strike that wins by uh, lasting for a very long time. And the other reason why he was opposed, not, not so much opposed, but he didn't think that the general strike was in itself a revolutionary weapon, was that he was sure that at some point um, workers would have to face the armed force of the state, police and the army, and so uh, they uh, should be ready to, fa to face that, that force. And so he turned the concept of general strike into the concept of armed strike. So workers should strike, but should be ready to fight because they should know that at some point they will have to face uh, the armed force of the state. And at that point... Um, the, the the choice is between capitulating or uh, moving the struggle to, uh, let's say, the, the military side, so uh, fighting with weapons. And so armed strike comes from this. More generally, I think on a more abstract level, the concept of armed strike points to that kind of, di of distinction that I mentioned before. So Malatesta didn't believe that uh, unions, syndicates, uh, would be self-sufficient. And especially he didn't think that interests, economical interests by themselves would turn into a revolutionary conscience. So he, would, he didn't think that unions could become revolutionary uh, forces. And this is something where it is very much distinct from Marxist thought, because for Marxists, the workers' movement would become political movements, and, and as political movements, aim for the conquest of power. Um, so there is one, one um, famous sentence by, by Marx and Engels, which I like to quote, about communism. So they say, communism is not an ideal that we want to reach, communism is the real movement, so something that's happening. Malatesta thought that there was a distinction between ideals and interests. Interests by themselves weren't enough to make a revolution. An ideal was needed. And so this speaks to that distinction between economical organizations, unions, that fight, fight for the interests of workers but cannot become revolutionary by themselves, and political movements, the carriers of the ideals that should work into those movements and inject the ideas into those movements. And so in the, in the, uh, in the concept of, of armed strike, you have both this element. The strike is the workers element, the workers mobilizing, but the armed part is more the anarchist part, the, the bearers of the ideal that uh, should inject in the workers in workers that revolutionary conscience that economical struggles by themselves cannot evolve. I, the, the first thing I want to ask you about, based on that, is um, maybe some of the similarities and differences between uh, Malatesta and some of the major figures from the Marxist tradition. You know, you've said that um, among Marxists, there might be this view that um, uh, the economic movement or workers uh, and their own control over workplaces and things like this inevitably becomes a political movement. Uh, but 
one thing that comes to mind is uh, that line from Lenin, which is maybe overused sometimes. Uh, um, workers on their own can only achieve at best trade union consciousness. So Lenin seems to have also weirdly um, had a kind of comparable view that the role of the vanguard or the role of a uh, communist revolutionary is to inject the kinds of ideals or as he would probably want to put it, the kind of scientific understanding, <laughs> give that to the workers so that they can achieve a kind of broader ideal than the movements on its own would try to accomplish. Do you think there's anything in common between Malatesta and Lenin on that? I think so. I must say I'm not a Lenin scholar, so I've read some Lenin, but even in terms of how his ideas and Malatesta's ideas evolved, I cannot say whether there was any relationship or which one came first, but superficially, I think, yeah, there is the same kind of idea of consciousness that, yeah, unionism by itself is not is not sufficient, and so uh, the, the 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 revolutionary conscience comes from elsewhere. But that's also where this similarity ends, because as you said, on the part of Lenin, that consciousness is the knowledge of how of that real movement I was talking about with the reference to Marx, the knowledge of how or what the economical and social dynamics are. So it's knowledge, not the revolutionary will as it is in Malatesta. It's, it's, I think that's an important difference, not just in this comparison between Lenin and Malatesta, but more generally uh, in the comparison between anarchism and Marxism. Anarchism traditionally is voluntary. They rely on, on will of wanting to make a revolution. Marxists rely on knowledge, knowing how, the way, the direction society is going. And so a typical discussion between Marxists and uh, anarchists would be that Marxists would say, okay, this is, the times are not ripe for revolution right now. We need, society needs to evolve in, in, in a certain direction. Uh, capitalism needs to reach its uh, ripeness before the time is ripe for revolution. And anarchists will say, no, nobody knows what's the right time for revolution. If we want to make it and we work to make it, we don't, we're not sure we are going to achieve it, but we should try and possibly we might achieve it. So this distinction between voluntarism and re um, relying on knowledge is very fundamental, I think, in understanding where anarchists and Marxists differ. The other thing I would say about Lenin is that the consequence of this idea, which somehow he shared with Malatesta, was that revolutionary should turn into uh, revolutionary by profession. This idea of this vanguard of uh, uh, revolutionists who have a better knowledge and become professional revolutionists who uh, uh, lead the movement is very foreign to Malatesta. Malatesta, in fact, throughout his life, he never wanted to be a revolutionary by profession. He, worked, he, he lived by his own work all the time. And he, he, he was very uh, suspicious of people living off the revolutionary work. He thought that revolution is something you do because you have an ideal, but you shouldn't make money out of that because at some point you have an interest in lead things going in a certain way because you you live on that. So yeah, uh, Malatesta was more influenced by the idea of the old Russian revolutionary movement of going to the people. He would say we should live among the people, share their life, and that's what he did actually share their life because that's the way of making ourselves believable to the people, not by leading them from above, which was the Leninist idea, but by sharing their life. It's interesting how much of, at least as you describe him, what Malatesta had said has in a sense been vindicated by the history of Marxism. 
um, as far as uh, this notion you were describing earlier of, you know, kind of your orthodox Marxist who thinks that communism will be achieved by a series of mechanistic transformation in the uh, system of economic relations in a society, something that later Marxists, like maybe Louis Althusser, tended to emphasize is the radical contingency of history that, as Althusser reads some of Lenin's letters, when revolution finally broke out in 1917, even Lenin seemed pretty astonished that it had happened. And regardless of what one makes of its conclusion, it seems like we could all agree that it went pretty far. Um, but even as far as this notion of a revolution from below, confessedly, a lot of my own background in Marxism also comes from the Italian tradition. My background in it comes from these discussions around obaismo and autonomism. And they seem to have noticed a similar problem to what Malatesta diagnosed um, in the way that the Communist Party of Italy and the Socialist Party of Italy was even operating in the 1950s, that they were trying to impose a certain set of uh, ideals and objectives onto workers' organizations that ultimately betrayed workers' interests as well rather than trying to make the organization for something like the self-emancipation of the working class. Yeah, I mean, there are many brands of Marxism, and so it's difficult to make any claim about Marxists in general because someone would uh, jump up and say, no, you are uh, misrepresenting because there is this thinker, that other thinker. There's a bit of everything in Marxism. So... Okay, it's difficult to make general claim. And definitely, I mean, there are some libertarian Marxists. There are even anarchists who call themselves Marxists while being anarchists. And, uh, and it's true what you said that, uh, for example, in the autonomists were much closer to um, a kind of thinking. I mean, much. they criticized uh, traditional Marxism and they were much closer in many respects to the anarchist movement, and in fact, let's say in the 1970s, um, autonomists and archi anarchists were, were closer. There were anarchists, anarchist organizations that called, called themselves autonomists, so there was a significant overlap. But unless one rejects Marxism altogether, in my view, there are some distinctions that remain, and this, I mean, if you if you reject the reliance of knowledge as the main driver of your revolutionary conscience and, and your understanding of reality, I think it's difficult to, to still call yourself a Marxist. So this distinction between voluntarism and uh, relying on knowledge is fundamental, and along with that goes another difference that Anarchists, well, let's say Malatesta for sure, but I would say anarchists in general make a distinction between what I call the descriptive domain and the normative domain. It's one thing to talk about reality, but the normative domain where you, you set a goal, you, you state the principles of your action, so the, the domain of action is a different domain. You cannot derive the principles of your action from the description of reality. So, for, for Malatesta, sharp distinction between descriptive domain and normative domain. Uh, for anarchy, for Marxists, this isn't true. They tend to conflate the two domains. And so, it's reality that dictates what you should do. And so, typically, Marxists are very, they despise uh, moral language, where the talking that the distinction between is and ought, that's, I would say, in general, denied by Marxists, whereas it's very relevant to anarchists. So this kind of distinction is there, no matter how blend, blended the two uh, currents may be in some particular thinkers, and I might ignore some of them, but I think this distinction is valid. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's some truth to that. Um, Let's go back to this concept of, of the armed strike and maybe talk a bit more about 
Malatesta and his relation to labor movements in the present day. Um, so I know from conversations with other anarchists that Malatesta belongs to this particular moment in the history of the development of anarchism, where there were a bunch of ideas that were kind of floating around, that were very popular then, but which seem to have fallen away slightly now. A big one being uh, the propaganda of the deeds. Um, so for some of his the, his bigger concepts or the bigger debates within anarchism that he participated in, especially, say, the propaganda of the deeds and the armed strike, do you think these are uh, still useful concepts for us to be using or useful kinds of praxis for us to be deploying today? Well, uh, th there are several aspects to that. The, the concept of propaganda by the deed has become popular in a particular uh, description, which is uh, a partial one. Um, and actually, th the debate about propaganda by the deed, I, I would say, was more relevant in the in, in the 1890s than in the decade after 1900. But very briefly, propaganda by the deed is a concept is a typical concept concept of anarchists and Malatesta practiced it, discussed it. It, it simply it means that facts speak louder than words, and so rather than um, uh, trying to make propaganda by explaining ideas or uh, by I don't know writing pamphlets, showing things by taking action is more more effective. So every kind of direct action, even if it doesn't uh, achieve an immediate success in terms of, uh, of uh, social benefit, even in that case, they are effective as an example because they, uh, they show uh, people uh, the way to go and the 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 the, 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 um, the value and the force of taking your life in your hands and taking direct action rather than hoping for I don't know uh, parliamentarians to uh, uh, promote laws that are in your favor. So it very much means relying on direct action, and definitely uh, uh, strikes are a form of direct action and so even if they cannot be called propaganda by the deed they are definitely uh, they go in that direction and so for example um, again this was more in the 1890s but uh, when the uh, the fight for the eight hour for the eight hours work day was uh, brought about uh, Malatesta would say, well, if you want the eight hours, instead of voting for parliamentarians to have a law for the eight hours, just work eight hours and then stop working. I mean, it's a simple way of putting it. It's not that simple, but it shows you uh, the distinction between relying on direct action and uh, relying on uh, parliamentary work and, and on laws. Now, so the arms strike uh, yeah, it doesn't relate probably much to propaganda by the deed, but um, mm. it relates very much to the kind of reality that uh, Malatesta saw um, in England during his stay there. So the workers' movement was very strong in England, but it was going in a direction which was not what Malatesta hoped for. So trade unions... Uh, actually practice direct action. And so they were an inspiration even for revolutionary uh, syndicalists, the French ones, and, f and also for Malatesta. So the, the kind of direct action uh, pr um, struggles that um, English workers, British workers used were also embraced by the French syndicalists and by Malatesta himself. Uh, when he... When he um, he went to Italy in 1897-98 uh, and he started to advocate involvement of workers, of uh, anarchists in the workers' movement, he would brought some of these uh, techniques 
like the boycott uh, that he had seen used in Great Britain, and he was accused uh, wanting to bring in Italy Inglesismo, so uh, Anglicism, the techniques that were used in Great Britain, but they were not uh, suitable for Italy. So this speaks to the kind of influence he had during his stays in, in, in London, the kind of inf influence that they had on his own uh, tactics and the kind of struggles that he advocated. Looking at Malatata today, it's hard not to wonder, and maybe this is kind of the wrong question to ask when looking at an important figure for the history of you know, revolutionary thought and re revolutionary action. But it's a question that it's difficult not to ask, which is how much their ideas can really bear on what we're doing today. Uh, if in their recent round of um, uh, strikes, um, the workers had started arming and the junior doctors got their hands on some weapons or the representatives of the World Call of Nurses or all of the nursing unions started arming the nurses. <laughs> Uh, do you think that that, for example, would have been a valuable tactic or would it have been even a plausible thing to try and do? I think, I mean, uh, many tactics can be used. And for when one thinks about uh, alternative tactics to insurrection or armed, an armed strike, we think of nonviolent struggles. And at Malatesta's time, nonviolence was mainly a moral or intellectual trend that was known as Tolstoyism. Uh, nowadays, we know much more because there have been uh, mass struggles led in non-violent ways. So if we think of the independence struggle in India, at least the part of it led by Gandhi because there were other uh, occurrences as well. But Gandhi was non-violent and he showed the strength of nonviolent struggle. So it is an alternative now, a much more credible and about which we know much more than at Malatesta's time. So anyone can choose or can favor one or the other tactic. But I think Malatesta's point, which is still valid, is whatever tactic we choose, we must know that we are going to face uh, the armed force of governments. We can't expect that governments and capitalists give up without fighting. So we must be ready for that. We must face that force in any way we like. Maybe we, we use uh, the kind of um, soul force that... Uh, Gandhi preached, but it's still a kind of force. We need to face uh, uh, that reaction and and we need to be prepared to that. And when we talk about non-violent struggles, let's be clear, they are non-violent on the struggler side, not on the government side. If we think, for example, about Gandhi's struggles, they were very, very violent in the sense that there was a lot of violence on the government side. If we think, for example, of massacres like the Amritsar massacre, it was horrible. So, Malteza's message is, let's not fool ourselves. Let's not think that we can make an easy, comfortable revolution. That's not going to happen. Violence is going to happen. And uh, this, the governments and the capitalists will not give up without using any means they have at their disposal. Let's be ready for that. I think that message is valid, and it's somehow, I think, undervalued today. Either people don't talk about revolution, or uh, they have some kind of velvet revolution in mind, which it would be nice to carry out, but I don't think... I think Malatesta was more realistic than whoever think that the kind of change, drastic change like uh, overthrowing capitalism can be carried out without having to face uh, the armed force of 
again, I think that's a really good point. I noticed some discussions among Marxists also veering in that direction as well of thinking that we can escape capitalism without a confrontation with the full force and power of the state. Um, I, I don't believe that Antonio Negri, for example, believed that we could escape capitalism without confronting the state. But I know there are some interpretations of his thoughts uh, that do seem to go in that direction a little bit, that something like the self-valorization of labor will shed capitalism in the states in a kind of nonviolent or peaceful way, which I find a little difficult to believe. I agree. Um, well, I think our conversation is sort of coming to a close now. So I wanted to ask you, uh, if you have any closing thoughts for our audience, or if there's anything else that you're working on at the moment that you'd like to share with them. Uh, well, I would like to mention one concept, which I think is very defining for Malatesta, and that's the concept of method. Uh, that's the key word for me, for whoever wants to know what Malatesta was about. Uh, the idea is that anarchism is not so much anarchy, actually. It's not so much a blueprint of a beautiful society. It's a method. Maldesta defined both anarchy as a goal and anarchism as a movement in terms of method. He used to say, when I, if you want to, to change society radically, all we can do is provide the method. We can't provide the blueprint. And the, meth the anarchist method is the method of freedom free initiative, free agreements. And so anarchy would be, is described not so much in terms of a blueprint, again, but in terms of a process, the process of practicing the method of freedom, which means we solve social problems by experimentation in an experimental and pluralist way where people are allowed to carry out the social, freely to carry out the social experiment. And then the best uh, um solution to the problems will come out of this uh, experimental and pluralist process. So method of freedom in the anarchist society, but method of freedom in our daily struggle also. And so free initiative and free agreement even now. And this, uh, I think this is important because it counters any stereotype about anarchism, which anarchists are seen as dreamers for the future and powerless or maybe violent in the, in the present. Whereas this concept of anarchism as a method breaks uh, the, the distinction between the present and the future because the method that the, pract the anarchist practice of the method of freedom is the same now and in the future. And uh, yeah, I think this is the ch central method, this is a central concept in Malatesta, so much so that uh, since we are talking about books, I want to close by mentioning another reader of Malatesta that uh, for people who are not interested in the complete works of Malatesta uh, might be interested in, and that's an anthology of Malatesta's writing published by AK Press, and the title I chose is The Method of Freedom. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for uh, offering that last clarification. That does seem like especially interesting in an especially novel part of Malatesta's approach to anarchism. Um, anyone who's interested, uh, please do check out the AK Press website. Take up, pick yourself up a copy of Erico Malatesta, The Method of Freedom War. If you're interested, keep an eye on the project for the complete works of Erico Malatesta. Davide, one more time, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. That was a pleasure. We appreciate your support of The Imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.